Hello and welcome to Just Films and That. This is the podcast where we talk about films we think are underrated or underseen normally. Um, but it's a little bit of something different this week. Alice is away on holiday. Um, so I'm going to be doing a Spotlight On style episode. It's something I've been wanting to do for a little while where I want to talk to more indie filmmakers uh, and more, you know, uh, other filmmakers, people in the industry, people who can, who can shed some light on what goes on. Uh, when you're making a film. Uh, in this case, it is uh, Matt Bauer. So Matt uh, has made a documentary called The Other Fellow, which is an exploration of loads and loads of guys who are all called James Bond. Um, and he's, you know, gone around the world talking to them about what it's like to be named after the world's most famous secret agent. But in doing so, discovers a lot more about things like masculinity, identity, and and, and loads, loads more. So uh, I sat down with Matt to have a little chat about it. So yeah, give it a listen and uh, see what you think. So I'm joined today by a uh, docu- documentary filmmaker, amongst other things. He's just got a, a new James Bond-related documentary out called The Other Fellow, which we're going to get stuck into talking about. Matt Bauer, uh, thanks very much for coming on. How are you doing, sir? Very well, thank you, Josh. Yeah, very nice to be here. You've got, it's one of the best weather days I've ever seen in the <laughs> UK today and yesterday so you've got me in a very good place it doesn't it doesn't take some it doesn't take some beating as i think the thing is with with weather here we're never happy are we because it's just been we just had a little bit of a heat wave at the time of recording yeah. and i i don't i don't do heat i don't like i'm a, no. I'm a winter guy and so i'm just lying there yeah, yeah. not able to sleep but at the same time when it's raining oh i'm miserable in it <laughs> Just yeah, well, like the I mean, grass this, is always this greener. Country, this country isn't set up for plus 30, you know what I mean? It <laughs> no, doesn't have air conditioning. It's not. It's and, not. And things. So, but I find in this country, often it goes from like cold to heat wave without that beautiful mid 20s oh, yeah, area absolutely. in between. And that actually just has been the past couple of days, which has been, yeah, really nice. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So let's, so we'll get stuck in, so, so we'll get stuck into talking about the other fellow then. So obviously the other fellow for the guys at home, if you don't know, it's a documentary that Matt's got out at the moment. It's in all sorts of places. I, I've watched it, really, really enjoyed it. So I, I, I knew this was coming out. I'd seen it advertised. I'm a massive Bond fan, as people who listen to the pod will know. Um, so I'm really interested. I'm very excited to get stuck into talking to you, to you about it. So for the people at home, just tell us a little bit about the background on this. So where, where did the idea come from? How did it come to fruition? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll say I'm actually really curious to hear what you think as well as a Bond fan who's just seen uh, the film as well. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I am like a lifelong Bond fan. Mm. Um, I was probably where I grew up in Adelaide, Australia. I was probably, you know, I was the biggest Bond fan in the neighborhood mm. kind of thing. Obviously, I've met bigger Bond fans both who star in this film and also the (laughs) the, the Bond fans of Britain I've met in the past few months. Um, But yeah, I was always a Bond fan, but it actually more came about. I, 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 when Facebook first started, I was part of a group called the, it sounds funny, but the Matthew Bauer Appreciation (laughs) Society. Um, You know, you have those dumb, you know, when Facebook first started, they'd just be Yeah, everyone, I think most people have looked for themselves on Facebook or Google or something. Yeah, yeah. And and we would, it was called Embassy, like Matthew Bowie would appreciate it. It's supposed to sound like like a bad nightclub night. (laughs) It it was very ironic, the group. Yeah. But but we would talk about like, you know, like who's got Matt Bauer at Gmail, you know, who's got Matt Bauer at Gmail. I'm sure you've had that thing where if you try and sign up for Josh Hallam at gmail.com, it's taken already. Yeah, yeah. And you go, oh, there must be another Josh Hallam out there somewhere. And so it was sort of coming from there. And as a Bond fan, at some point, it just clicked in my head. I was like, what if that, but for James Bond? And mm. obviously it would be that times a thousand, you know, and all of those things that would come with it. Um, so I actually jumped on Facebook itself. Um, and the first thing I noticed was actually there aren't James Bonds on Facebook. And I later found out from my Bonds that if you try and join Facebook as James Bond, it actually says you can't do it. It thinks it's like a Bond. Um, so, yeah. So, and, and I tried it myself and they're right. And actually it, it, it asks <laughs> if you want to make a James Bond fan page, which obviously really <laughs> pisses my characters off. So actually all my characters you see in the film, one of them is called James Bong, uh, like B-O-N-G. Um, <laughs> one of the, he's, yeah. Um, the, the, but Or they're called like J.B. Bond or Bond yeah. James or some very. So actually I kind of figured out if they had some weird variation on James Bond, there was a good chance they actually were a James Bond. And yeah, I just sent a ton of them just a spam Facebook message saying, hey, I had this idea for a documentary. You know, have you got any interesting stories to tell? And 
I was expecting the Aston Martin jokes and that kind of thing, but actually a lot of the stories they told me hewed more towards that G- mm. James Bond at Gmail thing that we're talking mm, about. Mm. And especially in, you know, 2023 or sort of, you know, the mid 2010s when we first started shooting this, it was kind of more about how kind of in like the tech age, if you will, having this name has this whole new dimension to it than, than it may have in the 1960s, even though we very much cover that period as well. Um, but a lot of those things, you know, this film kind of starts as a comedy, but by the end it's almost more of a techno thriller. I'm sure we'll get into this. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but, yeah, that's sort of what appealed to me. And, yeah, they, they came back with these kind of wild stories and kind of from that the film just sort of started slowly sort of taking shape. I think that's that's something I really enjoyed about it was that that it's it seems like quite a you know funny whimsical idea but as you go along you do in the documentary the bits I really enjoyed were the bit where you really get actually stuck into the logistics of being called James Bond so yeah obviously everyone expects the 007 the martinis the car all the jokes that you get but actually there are bits in it you know, where several of the James Bonds mention being stopped by the police having forgotten yeah. their ID and going Oh no, my name's James Bond. Yeah, and no, no, this I, is just assume they're taking sweet. the mic. Yeah, no, I mean, and I love. I mean, that's one of my favorite scenes of the film because it's so gloriously complicated. But you know, obviously, all of us in life get a, you know get pulled over by the police once or so in our life. But we all have that time we get pulled over when we don't have our driver's license. Mm. Honestly, that actually happened to me like last time I was back in Australia. You, you know, like it, it happens. But if your name is James Bond and you get stuck in that that very specific situation, you are in a lot of trouble because when you tell the officer your name is James Bond, it, you will see what, you see what happens in the film. But you know some of them end up you know getting violently apprehended. Um, you know by the police, one of them ends up in prison. You know as a result of that apprehension, um, and it's those kind of things that are kind of like seven chess moves ahead <laughs> yeah. that I think you don't expect. You go oh Aston Martin jokes, but that's not so much the problem for them. It's actually these kind of things when shit gets real. When how do I put? It? When shit gets real, <laughs> that's when the Bond name really comes in to it. Yeah, that's you know, when, when that's when you when, encounter the real problems. Yeah, or, or you know, when another man named James Bond is charged with murder, for instance, <laughs> that's when stuff gets real. Um, and that's obviously far more interesting, you know, as fodder for the film. So one thing I wanted to ask you about, actually, because one of the things I really liked about it was that you you sort of, and, I, and I, I think, I'm assuming this was a conscious decision, but you sort of employed cinematic structure to tell the story. So what I mean by that is you had the audience believe something was going one way and then it, it goes another. So obviously there's a story, there's a few storylines in it. Um, one, you know, one's actually quite dark about a a, a, a woman who is uh, unfortunately a, a, a victim of really quite serious, horrible abuse. And she takes the decision to move away. And and you introduce that about sort of halfway into the film, something like that, yeah. and you're watching it going, well, what's this about? It comes from nowhere. This lady just starts talking. And I, my first thing I thought, oh, but she's Jane Bond. Or, you know, it's, it's something yeah. like that. Yeah. And she starts yeah. talking and then she goes into these sort of really horrible details about what this, this awful, awful ex, uh, ex-husband of hers did to her. You realize, well, what she's done is she's utilized the popularity of the name to, to safeguard her son from his dad, her ex-husband. Because if you search James Bond in Google, obviously what you get is James Bond, the film franchise and the books and stuff like that. So if he was to search for him, trying to find him, which he found him multiple times, well, he wouldn't get anywhere with it. So that sort of thing by tricking you. And similar with, I think, one of the, the most famous aspects of this film, I think most people may have seen in other news outlets and stuff like that, is, of course, is Gunna, the... the um, is he Norwegian or Swedish? The, the Swedish, Swe- yes. yeah, Swedish Bond, who is a massive, massive James Bond fan and wants to be James Bond. And there's an element of that where obviously when news outlets cover it, it's that sort of light-hearted piece at the end of this man, really, this James Bond yes. superfan, blah, blah, blah. But when you look into it, what he says, and this is what I really like, and this is where the film really plays to the strength of what a documentary can achieve, is that you, you sort of go, well, why? He's not just a James Bond superfan. To be, to be that into James Bond... That's not just being a fan. There must be a reason behind it. And even he himself says that he is sort of exploring his relationship with his with his absent uh, father through 
the, through the James Bond character and this whole idea of his dad left and he sort of replaced his dad and the idea of his dad as well, dad's off being James Bond and all that sort of stuff. So that's that, that I thought that was really interesting because not only did he have the name James Bond, but he also had that relationship with the character and that, you know, he was really well into that sort of fantasy element of James Bond is the man that, that men want to be and women want to be with and all the stuff that we know about James Bond as, as a character, but also that applying that to his personal life. So I thought that was, that was really, really interesting. You know, if, if you're asking what I thought, that was what I thought was one of the strengths of it was that use of cinematic structure. It's almost like a, you know, like a lot of good that you say thrillers do is lead you down one way and go, oh, no, actually it's this. And I was wondering, was that a conscious decision or was that something that came along as you were making it? Yeah, very much so. I mean, I mean, it's funny when you talk about especially those two main characters. Obviously, the Swedish James Bond has occupied a lot of our like marketing campaigns. Yeah, yeah. It's actually, it, it's actually, you know, you kind of need to explain the film in an image. So all of our promotional images are any of our characters when they're dressed in a tuxedo, mm. or you know, we we use a still from the the casino ad, for instance, because otherwise you're just looking at a picture of somebody and it doesn't it's just tell a, just a person, yeah. The story. So he's obviously <laughs> occupied a lot of that, but. He, is actually a giant distraction from you know the, the the big story of the film which is that well the big spoiler of the film is that you know in a film about that that's very much marketed as about men named james bond the the lead character is actually a, a woman yeah um and that the lead character you know in the end is james bond's mother um mm. and you know that came about because you, you know really when you make this film everyone's first question is of course why would you name your your child this you know and with her we kind of had the ultimate answer um but in terms of the structure of the film the idea was i mean the the repetition of this film is insane i mean every single character who comes on screen is a man named james bond you know and we <laughs> train you with that ad nauseum you know i mean the the you, you might only pick it up the second time but there are actually some who only come up for like one shot even mm. you know there there are some who are literally only in the film for three seconds but it's like Obviously, it's another guy called James Bond, another guy called James Bond. And obviously, then halfway through, it suddenly cuts to this woman and you are meant to be left going. You know, you say you were thinking it might be Jane Bond. Yeah, um, you know, yeah. We, we worked very, we, we are working very hard to control what your mind is going through. Mm, it's like a magic trick, isn't it? Throughout that whole experience, yeah. And so even though you're watching the story about her and the house and all of the abuse that's going on, what's going on in your mind is trying to connect that back to the main mm. narrative. And, and you know, it was a lot of work. Uh, you know, a lot of people say something similar to you. A lot of people think that she's trans, you know, and that oh, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. So that there's that's something like yeah. that going on in the film. And they're like, I know it sounds wild, but I was thinking this. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. no, that we kind of want you to think that maybe it's someone, it's a woman who's changed her name to James Bond mm. or sort of something like that. Um, and yeah, I, I, that, that's kind of the narrative kind of trick of the film, um, you know, and, and that's kind of what makes it a movie because, you know, at the point where it cuts to her, it actually couldn't cut to another James Bond. Do you know what I mean? If I cut mm. after the after the whole murder storyline, if we suddenly went to another guy called James Bond, we'd be like, oh, "All right, come on, <laughs> you know, you know, how, how long are we how long are we <laughs> yeah, going to do no, this?" Yeah. That's a really Here's good another point. Bond four, and so you know, it is the structure of the film, but it's also the only st possible structure of this film. I mean, you can't you, you can't do a film that's a, a all about martini jokes. You know, I mean, all the <laughs> martini jokes we get out the way in like the first five. So say it's the first the few minutes, isn't it? Um, you know, but yes, I think that's sort of, that's sort of, you know, if this was a, you know, 50 minute long channel four documentary <laughs> about let's meet some crazy men named James Bond, that would be one thing, but you know, this is very much a feature film and then, you know, that story is sort of what gives it that. Yeah, it's the, it's the re I think it's the, it's the real heart of it as well. But I, I, I did love that. I, I love that, that that you say that it's, it's the exact right moment where the film comes to a natural crescendo and then well, what could be next? Like, what what, what next yeah. scenario could this name? And then she starts talking and you think, like you say, oh, what's, you know, what's this all about? And I loved that sort yeah. of slow reveal of what yeah. it is. Because you employ yeah. that and, technique. And, uh, so, sorry, go on. No, I was just saying, hopefully the scene where all is finally revealed in the police station, that is supposed to, it's supposed to be something. You, oh, you know I love that I mean? scene, it's, absolutely. It's, and I love the fact that you um, when you went and found him, if if it is him or if it yeah. maybe it'll be an actor speaking for him or whatever, he's clearly like he's grown he's grown up. He is he's almost the most like actual James Bond. 
like when you see him talking it's 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 you know he's that he's quite yeah he's quite macho he's quite obviously he's, he's boxing in it and stuff like that so you have yeah. those sort of links to to sort of masculinity and stuff like that but i did I re- what, one yeah. of the things i really love was that sort of sleight of hand style technique that you used a few times because there was that there's the scene where um the scene where Gunnar is talking to a gravestone and he's also talking about how he's his relationship with his dad. And you think, oh, he's talking to his dad. He's not. He's talking to Ian Fleming's gravestone. But the one yeah. that really got me, and I'm quite good with, obviously I've watched loads of films. I talk about films, write about films. So the structure of films, I'm very much can learn how to read a film and yeah. see what's going to happen next and all that sort of stuff. The one that absolutely got me was that three of them were were related or more, more than three of them yeah, were related. Four of them, yes. Four of them yeah. related. And I was like, it just didn't, it just didn't click for me that, to be yeah. a grandson, a son, and a grandson, and a and a, and a great grandson. Yeah, they were all from the same town, and they're all yeah. you know what is it? one's a reverend, one's a one's yeah, a one's IT an oil guy. worker, one's a yeah. computer programmer, one's a kid. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if you actually go back to the first scene, those three are actually introduced as a group. You know, we introduce the old one, then the then the son, then the whatever at the start of the film. But we don't put a title card on the second and third because if it just said Texas, Texas, yeah, Texas, yeah, yeah, you would sort of get the idea. But I mean, it's funny how those things come about. You know, for the longest time, that was we were we were thinking, oh, we'll explain that at the start of the film. Like, here's a family of men named James Bond, mm. um, and it was really a couple of things. Firstly, my editor had the great idea, and it happens a lot with things. It was like, no, that should be the ending, not the beginning of their story. Um, and also, as I have, as a first-time director, the thing that I actually missed, we did interviews with all of them. And, of course, when you're there, it's very obvious that they're the Bond family. But I actually neglected to get the soundbite of any of them saying, my name is James Bond and I'm part of a family of four men <laughs> named James, James Bond. And I didn't get them all going, my dad's name is James Bond, which <laughs> seems obvious. But we had like eight hours of interviews, but we didn't have that soundbite. And so it actually kind of necessitated that thing where we do it at the end. The other was James Hart here in London, who course, yeah. changed his name from James Bond. Originally, we were always like, of course, at the start of the film, we'll explain this is a man who changed his name from James Bond to something else. Um, and actually, in the end, that became the end of the story, not mm. the beginning. Um, and it is something I kind of learned, something I'll kind of remember in future is often it is what you're thinking is the starting point of a story, actually the end point of the mm. story and, and sort of vice versa. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, the structure of the film really came together when we did sort of make those kind of swaps yeah. and actually leave something as a reveal rather than an, an introduction. And for the rest of the film, just let them be a guy called James Bond. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 so for me, that's one of the real strengths of the film, which is by employing by employing cinematic structure that you would associate with a fictional piece – you you trick your audience, and I think that's what really kept me engaged throughout. Obviously, I'm a bomb fan. I would have been, probably been engaged if it had have just been martini jokes and Aston Martin yes. jokes, but not everyone would be. And I think that's that's one of the real strengths of the piece. So I, I did think that was really good. So for something that was interesting, yeah. was how sort of what goes into the logistics of you know making something like this because obviously it's international. There's you know yeah. there's people in the states, London. There's a guy from Guyana. Um, there's other people from other you know like you say Sweden and stuff like that. So what what really goes into the logistics of making something like this? Are you just constantly traveling on a plane, talking to you know going to different places, meeting different James Bonds? Yeah, it's it's. I mean, I mean, I, I would say being as my first film, I now know how to make it. A lot more easily my next <laughs> film will be a much i'm actually doing the schedule for that today and i now uh, i'll give you an example for my next film we are f- a lot of it set in america but we are going to rent a studio and fly all the subjects to that studio for their mm. interview and we'll rent one studio in london and fly people from europe you know in there whereas on the other fellow I actually flew with a camera person and, you know, and hired a local sound person. And so all the interviews you're seeing are actually in all of their houses, mm. which now I'm like, that was so stupid. Like you would mean so, even though it doesn't seem like it, it, it'll be so much cheaper in the end to rent a studio for one week <laughs> somewhere and, and fly each one of them in and get them a hotel room for the night rather than two of you flying to them, mm. you know, renting cars, all that kind so of thing. So much travel. Um, <laughs> Make yeah, them so come it, to you sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, it, it's easier in the end. Yeah, so that was a bit of a learning um, experience. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, I think it, it, but, but yeah, I, I'd say that the way this film got made was it was it started off as my thesis film um, at like NYU, mm. um, and so for that you get like like about a ten thousand dollar stipend, you know, that kind of kick things off. And then to be honest, I mean, what I like about documentary a lot, and I discovered this by accident, is you you can film it over a number of years. You know, most of the sh- most stuff you're seeing in the film is like something shot on a weekend um, where, you know, th- there's an old trick, which is that if you hire a camera for one day that you pick it up on a Friday, <laughs> the, the, the rental place is closed on Saturday. So you actually get it for three days until Monday morning <laughs> rather than that. And so it basically, it, it probably the whole film is about 50 shoots, which cost between 250 and maybe wow. the most expensive was like 2,500 pounds. Um, and so what I like with doc is you can slowly mm. build something and you also have the room to make mistakes. You have the room to go down wrong roads, you, you know, and it's not kind of the end of the world. Whereas, you know, I, I didn't originally want to go into documentary. It's just that this film was a documentary mm. concept. And I think you'll see, it's a very cinematic version of a documentary oh, definitely. film yeah absolutely um, it is, but, yeah. but but it, it it just kind of necessitated that but but you know I, I i've seen with a lot of people who i was at film school with and they would go and do their first feature like this is for me and they would do you know a fiction film and the problem with that is you've got to raise all the money first before you start shooting uh which was a problem we didn't have on this film um and then you go out and you shoot for 30 days and you know, a lot of the time on your first film, you know, you then that's in the can and you get in the edit room and you go, well, this is terrible. Right. <laughs> and you go, this, this doesn't work. Do, do you know what I mean? But, but, but then you've spent all your money already on the shoot. And so you're kind of stuck with what you've got and you see, especially on the film festival world, you realize how much like most films that are made, nobody ever sees, mm. you, you know, and it is hard to make something kind of decent. And what, what I grew to like in documentary, I mean, I mean, this film, Three years ago, the other fellow was terrible. I mean, our cut was, you, you know, you're, you're, most of the time you're working with something which isn't good enough yet. But, but with Doc, you can just go, okay, let's shoot a little reenactment bit here and a little bit here and whatever and kind of slowly sculpt something um, in just saying the words. But I always say, I think that's why, you know, if you go on like Rotten Tomatoes, most documentaries are quite high scoring. Mm relative to fictional films and i think that's because of the thing we're talking about here which is that you know document documentaries they kind of can keep plugging away until it works but i think with a lot of fictional stuff it's like well we you know you might have money in the budget for a two-day reshoot or something Mm. um you know but whereas documentary you're kind of always on a reshoot (laughs) in one way or another it it, it sounds like it really sort of really comes together i mean I've, I've heard many many times from different directors about how much a film comes together in the edit but that sounds like that's it's just as much the case in something like a documentary yeah i mean or it doesn't come together in the edit you know and that, that's what happens a lot as well i'm just saying the beauty is if it if it isn't coming together in the edit you know it's 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 not like oh we've got to get these five actors Mm. you know, back and hire all the stuff <laughs> yeah, again. Um, it's just a lot kind of easier um, with that. But, yeah, it definitely comes together in the edit. Um, you know, if you had seen edits of this five years ago, it was it was awful. Um, you know, but I think most <laughs> most documentarians would say that about, in fact, most filmmakers would say that about the early cuts of their mm. films. So, so what's, the, um, what's the earliest shot in this film then, like roughly speaking? The, the first one we shot? Yeah, so that was the I, first thing you shot that made yeah, it into the film. So it started as... This started as my thesis film uh, at NYU. So the actual first part of it was a short film that I submitted for my, my final kind of project. And that was in 2012. That was when Skyfall wow. was was coming out. Um, yeah. And so I, I I kind of filmed that. And then it was kind of a while of like, you know, is this a TV thing? Is this a mm. film? Kind of whatever. You're still finding what um, it is but, sort of thing. Yeah. But also with docs, I mean, as you're shooting things change, I mean, you'll see there's, there's, a, there's a whole murder storyline the film you know and that happened while we were after we'd started shooting um you know where we we wrote to the suspect you know whose name is obviously james bond <laughs> um in prison and he agreed to be part of it um the swedish james bond we didn't have to begin with because he was actually everything i was trying to avoid 
mm. at first. You know what I mean? So I was yeah. like, but it was only kind of when we actually looked into his story more, we were like, no, this guy does deserve to be in this film. But mm. also the, the rest of our film was too negative and it was focusing too much on men who hated being James Bond. So it was actually great to have someone in who loved being James mm. Bond um, and kind of balance that. And then, you know, the, the, the main female of the film, she didn't, she was, I think the last interview we did. And that was a result of the fact that, you know, we tried to tell her some story from his perspective, but obviously it was all secondhand. Not, you know, he was just like, mm. my mom said this, my mom said, yeah, yeah. this happened. So you it know? came from him then, did it came from the son? It started with him, yeah, and it was only when we met her that I was like, I mean, she's amazing on camera, and that was the big mm. kind of change where we were like, oh, you have a real something to you. Um, and so, yeah, so I mean, these things just slowly build. Come, come together. Um, yeah, and I think with most documentaries, you know, there, there's the film like Capturing the Freedmans, um, you know, which is about the kind of sexual abuse family in, in New Jersey sort of thing. And I mean, that film started because the director was making a film about clowns, you know, of New York. Cause one of the brothers is a clown. You see mm. briefly in the film and you know, there was, was a film about clowns and then he met that one clown and then met his whole family and it completely changed. And obviously it's an extreme example. Um, but you, you know, the, the, especially with documentary, these things do, grow and evolve you know i think you have to be open to that as well yeah i suppose by the nature of them they're not they're, you know they're not they're not sticking to a script or even necessarily a, a set structure you sort of have an idea you know where you want to get with it but even that changes you just sort of i think they they, they very much start with that concept and go from there don't they yeah no i, I mean we had a lot with this film there, there is i'll be honest with you there's probably more reenactment in this film than i would really like there to mm. be actually you know that there's a sequence where my favorite scene is the casino commercial just because <laughs> it's the most it's there's no fakery there that it's just like 10 minutes in an episode of the office you know watching a really uncomfortable fly on the small situation happen and i think that's the most pure documentary <laughs> Scene, like, you know. curb your enthusiasm isn't it it's, uh... yeah yeah and i love that sequence but what what happened as we were filming is so much of the meat of people's stories ended up being something that took place in the 1960s or the 1990s or or the, even the second world war um and so it kind of just necessitated having a lot more reenactment in there than we initially um, mm. sort of plan because we originally tried to do a lot of it with just like you know photos from the second world war or old family photos or whatever and it was incredibly boring and obviously being james bond related the film did seem to be calling out for you know some planes and some helicopters mm. and some violence and that kind of thing <laughs> uh, but it definitely wasn't the plan um yeah originally but no, I think that's really interesting. I think there's some really interesting ideas in there, obviously around identity, because that's the whole that's the whole thing, isn't it? Like, for example, I think if you were to look at, at look at Gunnar, the Swedish James Bond, you would, I think, when you see it, they say it on the news and stuff like that. I think people would assume, oh, he just likes the films. But actually, if you listen to what he says, he's taking it from the books. So it yes. is even before it's even before Doctor No or anything like that. So he he's built his identity before Sean Connery ever said the famous words or, and, you know, yeah. henceforth there, all the, you know, the franchise started. So I thought that was really interesting and stuff like that. I quite like the reenactment bits. I thought that they, they reminded me of um, things like the Laramie Project. Have you ever seen the Laramie Project or the Vagina Monologues is something that's probably more famous where they've taken, you know, verbatim interviews and just made something out of them. I, I thought that was a real, yeah. I really, really, really enjoyed that sort of thing. So, and the thing for me, you know, it's, this is what documentaries are about. It's about a really strong concept that takes you somewhere where you probably didn't think you were going. Yeah. And it does happen a lot. I, I spoke about this with a few people, but I didn't kind of entirely get this going in, but I get it now. Like I, I love those films that have like a twist ending mm. to them. They were my real bread and butter growing up. And I think that extends to, cliffhangers in in mm. tv shows you know like lost or 24 or my <laughs> yeah. real you know breaking bad to you're my real and you know, they always end on the, the 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 big twist at the end of an episode um but in documentary you'll see that the twist is normally a half more of a halfway turning point um you know if you look at something like searching for sugar man where you find out the guy's actually alive 
halfway through or like the imposter where it actually becomes about did the family kill the son mm. rather than this and often with that it means that the film that has been advertised to you actually isn't the real film you know what i mean you've you've kind of been sold a fake movie mm. and then the real movie begins um, but I, but I think the halfway twist happens in documentary because you can't really do a final twist in documentary because you know something like the usual suspects you know it's like oh the whole thing's been a lie <laughs> you can't do that in a documentary because it's meant to be a true story yeah. right and there is um, no end point yeah I mean you could do a documentary that feels completely real then at the end the twist is it was all fake but that that probably is going to piss an audience off but <laughs> I get with Doc why why that twist kind of has to come sort of earlier. And I think in the end, we very much kind of hewed to that sort of structure as well. Well, something I was interested, you know, when there's, there, obviously there are shots in this that you presumably didn't do yourself. Like there's a lot of home videos of say Gunner, for example. Yeah. Are they just, did they just give you those? Or did you just go and get them from news outlets and things like that? Yeah, How does that sort yeah, of thing work? It varies, yeah. I mean, G Gunnar in Sweden has a YouTube channel um, right, where he posts all the media about himself. And the stressful thing when you're making a documentary for years is he posts on that channel about every day. <laughs> so, so every time you come back to the channel, you've got another like 300 videos he's made yeah. of himself to, to maybe look through. Uh, but yeah, there, there's various places. And then there's a lot of kind of, obviously we couldn't use clips from the James Bond films. So we mm. used a lot of clips of what we found is, thankfully the actor who plays James Bond is always dressed as James Bond at the premiere yeah. of a film. So, yeah. you know, you can't get Pierce Brosnan as James Bond, but you can get video of him in the tuxedo mm. on a red carpet. Which is um, fam famously one of the reasons George Lazenby only did one. Yeah, is yeah, of yeah, because showed he didn't a, he, showed up in a showed beard, beard. For <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and so so we used a lot of that kind of stuff, and you'll see it as well when whenever you have like James Bond, like even though we're kind of an unofficial thing, most James Bond media is on. You know, I've got I've got a book here called like Some Kind of Hero by AJ Chowdhury, which is like it's an unofficial. It's it's not made by Eon. You know, mm. on most James Bond books or stuff or, you know, even TV documentaries about the Bond films kind of are these, like, unofficial things. And the trick that a lot of the, especially the authors who've done it before, kind of taught us is, you know, if you're reading one of these books about the history of the James Bond films, you're not actually looking at a still from the movie Goldfinger. You're looking at an associated press photo that was taken yeah. on a set visit. Like a, it's like a mirrored a image, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you're looking at an on-set photo taken by a press agency and you can go to the Associated Press and buy that photo um, and still then get Bond into your kind of thing. And so, mm. yeah, there's a lot of that footage um, sort of in there as well. I'm very familiar with the Getty Images James Bond <laughs> <Yeah>. archive. <laughs> So, so something I did want to ask you is we'll, we'll start sort of wrapping up now was has, sure. has this film, has it changed your relationship with the James Bond franchise or the character in any way? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what this film does is I think more than anything else, it does show how wide the James Bond phenomena mm. is. And I think probably more than anything else that's out there, it shows how much this is this world spanning never ending eternal franchise you know mm. and just through these guys eyes having to deal with it every day i think you don't think about how big bond is and kind of in a way it reaches further than like star wars do, do you know what i mean mm. like everyone knows who james bond is in a way that you know like a lot of people in china probably don't know who luke skywalker mm. is in quite the same way and yeah you realize how kind of how big it is um yeah and how sort of unending this thing is um those yeah. are the, those are the two big franchises for me where if there is a bond film or a star wars film in the cinema i think you get that's where you get people going to the cinema who don't normally go to the cinema yeah that, that, and that those are the two and i think it is it is bond because you will get people who they're not bothered on marvel comic book films science fiction films yeah. whatever's you know in at the moment but they will make the time to go and see a Star Wars or go and see a James Bond because, and I suppose it's longevity and nostalgia is a big part of that because they've both yeah. been going for, you know, Bond since 62, Star Wars since 77. Um, and there's, a, you know, there is also, I think, an element of consistency and stuff like that there as well. But no, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. So, so 
how how has it changed your relationship? Do you think is it, is it just is it just that you become aware of it? Or suppose yeah. the big question of this is a lot of it is a, is an explanation of, of masculinity. Has it shed any light on anything in terms of masculinity or identity yeah. for you? Yeah, at it's all? definitely made me realize how much I, I never thought of. I, we always hear that term, you know, men want to be him, women want to love him, <laughs> yeah. but it, it did make me look like really about how much our idea of modern masculinity is very mm. much shaped by James Bond. And, and I've used this term a few times, but I get why is that it's kind of created this very like new age, like kind of like duty free shop version of masculinity, you know, and it's very <laughs> consumer age where, you know, these days it is very much about, you know, a man is about, you know, what, what alcohol he drinks, you know, mm. what, what, what car he drives. Mm. Um, always that kind of like sex in the city version of masculinity. You know, th- th- that's yeah. What suits he wears and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and you see it with the films. It is kind of, you know, very much about like, you know, like, like products and selling things and that kind of thing and mm. how much it kind of has shaped the modern man in that way. It kind of is. I mean, I think, you know, obviously the characters in my film have to deal with living in the shadow of James Bond. But I think as men, we all have to live, you know, in, in the shadow of of, mm. of James Bond. You know what I mean? Even just down to the fact that it's like, you know, like like you talk about like modern toxic masculinity and this kind of thing. Um, you know, that you know, men grow up wanting a Bond girl. You, you know what I mean? Like, it's, mm. it's like a lot of stuff is very, you know, you know, di- dictated by that. And I think, yeah, but Bond, I think, does have a very big impact on our collective psyche. Um, mm. Yeah. And kind of in quite, obviously in our film, it's a very magnified version of that because these people constantly are compared to this man. But in some ways, all of us men are being constantly compared to James Bond. Do you know what I mean? When, yeah. we, when we feel deficient... In some way, it, it is kind of in in ways in which we are not that atypical alpha male, which is sort of personified, you know, mm. by him. Um, you know, and yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I, I get why there's a lot of like, you know, academic think pieces out there on James Bond. I think underneath the hood of, you know, this action series, there is a lot in yeah. there. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's been interesting in that regard. I. I've definitely tired a bit of Bond just because I've been, I've had a lot of you know like <laughs> if you go if you go to this if you go to the B section on my phone it's just twenty men named James Bond. How, so that's interesting actually. Families. How do you how do you keep them in your phone then? How do you know what, did you put there where they're from or something? Yeah, there? it's always there. And then saying Texas, it, it yeah. obviously in the film, there's a lot of places where there's two or three, so they kind of have you know not one A, you know this sort of thing. <laughs> But then I know all their families as well, so they're all yeah. there. So they, anyway, there's been a lot of bond in my life, and I, uh, yeah, and you'll see in the film is that there's kind of a timeline of Skyfall, Spectre, No Time to Die mm. going on, and so it sounds funny, but when there was like say the premieres of, of the last two films, I was there screen recording the BBC news coverage mm. of it and that kind of thing um yeah like you, you'll see in the film this sequence where james hart is actually at a bond premiere you, mm. you know and it kind of meant i, I was sort of distracted by that so long story short is i'm actually really looking forward to the next james bond film is it's it really the, nice. as in the, yeah the re be the first one you've yeah. watched that's got no Whatever ties to is, this it's gonna be the first one where i'm not in a while where i'm not making a James Bond <laughs> documentary at the same time, and I can just enjoy the film. I actually you know. enjoy it for what it is. Yeah, no, it's um, brilliant. Yeah. So, for the guys at home, then where can they where can they uh, you know, where can they find what where can they find the other fellow? What and, and what's next for you? Where can they find you? What's next? Sure. Um, yeah, if you want to find the film, um, the best place to go is to theotherfellow.com. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm speaking for your worldwide audience here, Josh. <laughs> uh, if you are anywhere around the world, theotherfellow.com is the best place to go. Otherwise, it's, it is on Amazon in uh, most locations where your listeners would probably be. Um, here in the UK specifically, um, it is on Amazon. It is on Apple TV. Uh, it is on the Sky Store uh google play youtube um yeah yeah th- those kind of services you can find and to be honest if you, if you type it in on google google gives you some handy uh yeah easy links, links. Brilliant. on that um, and then just yeah. quickly what's next for you i am making a new documentary uh which is called ethanol um which is about the world's largest drug problem um mm. which is the drug ethanol which is the drug you find in alcoholic beverages mm-hmm. um which is a film which 
surprisingly doesn't exist actually. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah. So that is that's the next project. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we'll make sure to put links to the other fellow on the website and, and all that in, in here and any of your social media as well. So if you want to check out what Matt's up to, make sure you do watch the other fellow, especially, you know, especially if you're a Bond fan, but even if you're not, it's really interesting exploration of identity and masculinity. Uh, Matt Bauer, thanks very much for joining me. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Really great being on. So there we go. That was our first uh, spotlight on uh, episode where we sat and talked to Matt. Um, really great guy. Really good to chat to. I'm a massive, massive Bomb fan. So to be honest, whether he whether he's coming on or not, I would have uh, watched this and uh, wanted to talk about it to somebody. So I'm glad I got to do it to you. Lovely people at home. Thanks very much for listening. Um, I will make sure we put links to the other fellow and Matt stuff in the episode description. Do check it out. As I say in the episode, even if, you're, even if you're not a Bomb fan, you just want something that's quite interesting about I identity and masculinity then do uh, give it a listen uh, we'll be back next week with another episode hopefully alice will be back then but you know what she's like she was off bloody gallivanting isn't she um so you're stuck with me some of the weeks <laughs> um anyway uh, thanks very much for listening it's goodbye from me cheerio mm-hmm.